All right, guys, on today's video, we're gonna take a look inside my bow building shop. We're gonna look at some of the tools that I use, how I've got things laid out, and maybe it'll give you some designs that you can incorporate in your own setup. So let's get going. All right, guys, so uh, things are a little bit of a mess right now. I just got done with a bow building class, and so things are kind of scattered around all over the place. But what we're gonna do is just uh, start right here. We're gonna work our way around the outsides. We'll look, take a look up into the rafters. Uh, we'll take a look at what I've got on this table and anything else that I see that uh, I think you, might, you guys might be interested in. But the first thing I wanna point out is this old sewing machine. This is an old Pfaff, a German made sewing machine. I use this for uh, stitching up rawhide handles. It's a great piece of equipment to have. All right, so moving on around here. Got a box of light bulbs, I need to put that up. Uh, I've got my little drill press here. Uh, you've seen me use this for uh, footing shafts. I've got a little jig that I got from Three Rivers uh, where you can do like hardwood footings in, in, uh, in shafts and also use it for any number of other things. I've got my welding machine and pretty much everything else in here, all my tools for working on my truck. Uh, my little bandsaw, my little Ryobi, I've had this thing for probably 20 years, still going strong. Uh, I use this for cutting arrows to length um, cutting slats for uh, tip overlays, for tip reinforcements or recurve reinforcements, uh, any number of things like this. I use this thing a lot. And of course, I've got a bunch of bow backing strips up here. And if you need bow backing, you can get that on my website. All right, so as I said, I just got done with a bow building class. So I've got a lot of the tools uh, just kind of laid out here. I normally have them hung up on pegs, um, but We'll just go through some of them. I've got a couple of different draw knives. I'll run, you know, usually have two to four students in a class, and so everybody has their own draw knife. Um, chasing rings, reducing belly wood, all that kind of good stuff. Have a couple of them that are not very sharp, and then I usually do keep at least one that's razor sharp, and I use them for different reasons uh, or different stages in the bow building process. Uh, a sharp chisel, I use this for chiseling out my fades, uh, for putting in a, an arrow shelf if you want a shelf in your bow. And then one other tool that I haven't really shown a whole lot in bow building videos is this little curved wood gouge. This thing is really nice for getting around knots, but where it really comes into its own is if you have a stave that has a dip in the back and it's impossible to get with a draw knife. You can use this thing to get down in those recesses and get that, uh, get that ring off the top of the one that you're chasing. Uh, the Japanese cutoff saw, little cabinet maker saw. Again, use that for um, cutting in arrow shelves, cutting the ends off staves, uh, any number of things. Make two piece bows with that. I've got uh, a couple of different rasps in here. One of the rasps that I really like is a Nicholson uh, number 49 and number 50. It's a curved rasp, it's got a flat side, it's fairly aggressive, uh, but these things come in really nice, especially for around the fades and anywhere you've got a little dip or curve that you need to get into. Got a bunch of Tight Bond 3, I love this stuff. That's what I glue on my limb uh, tip overlays uh, and any kind of, if I need to do a reinforcement or anything like that on the belly side of a bow. I'll use tight bond to do that. A couple of things of wood glue, uh, my compass, use this for scribing limb thickness, uh, laying out the profile of bows, things like that. Got uh, an assortment of different size and uh, shape scrapers. And I got all these, I think these, th these came from Three Rivers, I can't remember. Uh, I got my bow square, Got a moisture meter. I usually check the moisture content in all of my staves. Um, with Osage and some of the harder woods, it can be hard to use a moisture meter because the wood is so dense, it's, it's hard to get the, uh, the prongs in there deep enough to get a, an accurate reading because you're reading the surface moisture. But if you cut the end off of a stave or if you remove some of that belly wood and get to a deeper point of that stave, then you can stick those prongs in there deep enough and actually get an internal or an accurate reading on the internal moisture content of that wood. And so for my Osage, personally, if I'm building a bow, I like the moisture content to be pretty low, four or 
you get it that low and you get better performance, but you also, it makes the wood a little bit more brittle. So um, it's kind of a trade off that way. Uh, I've got my drill with a point brush on there for building arrows. Got uh, some string material. Keep all my arrow building stuff in here. Got a big block of ferrule tight, bunch of tips, things like that. Got all my clamps up here for uh, doing recurves and reflex. And I'll show you my jig. It's around here somewhere. I've got a couple of different jigs that I use for doing back set, uh, recurves, and things like that. And now we'll move on to my tiller and rack. My tiller and rack, um, I've kind of changed it over the last uh, year or two or so. And what I've done, I used to have a block sitting right here which would hold the bow up on top. But since then, I have moved to a cradle of just some leather. And what that allows, it really allows the bow to move freely in this thing. And so when I'm tillering, when I'm pulling on this bow, uh, I'll, I'm, all, I'm looking at how the limbs are bending, but I'm also looking at how this handle is moving. Because sometimes if you're tillering a bow with a lot of character, let's say you have a natural bend to or away from the belly, it can, it can sometimes be hard to tiller those bows just based on how the limbs look because those natural bends towards the belly will look like a hinge when they're really not bending at all. But that, uh, a lot of that stuff will show up in the handle. If you watch how that handle rocks, uh, the handle will rock towards the stiffer limb. Uh, all of the stuff, you know, th this isn't something I've covered in depth in any of my YouTube videos, but it is something that I've covered uh, on the videos that are on my Patreon site. Uh, as far as the, uh, the pulley down here, all I've got is a piece of uh, half inch rope run through a pulley down there. And then I've got a little bow scale, uh, that I got from three rivers, hook that on the bowstring, And so I can pull it and that way I can keep an eye on the weight and not exceed my target weight. And so I'm, if I'm aiming for a 50 pound bow, you know, I don't want to get past 50 pounds. Um, and that bow scale, when I have students here, that thing really helps uh, to keep folks uh, under their weight. And my tiller and string. I just made this out of a piece of paracord. Uh, I got a couple of um, just leather cups on the end so I can stick them over those knocks uh, and start tillering the bow without having to cut the knocks in. And then up here, I've got uh, my little ace uh, spine master that I used for spining my arrows and getting uh, getting my match sets. Got a couple of staves in the corner, a couple of half finished bows. I'll get to those things someday. All right, so this vise right here, this is where I do all of my bow building uh, within the last probably four or five years. Um, and if you've watched any of the videos that I've got on Patreon, you will have seen this thing a lot. Uh, it's basically just an Irwin vise. I think it's a, I don't, know, I don't know how big it is. It doesn't have to be super big to build bows, but you want something big enough that's gonna hold uh, your stave. You want something that's tough enough that's gonna withstand all that jerking and, and pulling on this thing. Cause when you're back in the stave, when you're taking that thing down to one ring, um, you're really putting a lot of force on this thing. And to have a vise just mounted to a table, unless that is a massively heavy table, you're gonna be pulling that thing all over your shop. And so what I've done is just mount this thing to a, a four inch steel uh, post. And then down here in the, in the uh, cement floor, I just went ahead and tapped four big bolts and this thing is, is bolted to the floor and you'd have to have a bulldozer to, to jerk this thing out of the ground. But uh, I really like this setup, and then I'll show, my, uh, show you my bow building bench over here. I don't use that often, but it comes in really handy when I've got students. Uh, got my furnace, or my, uh, my wood stove. I get that thing cranked up in the wintertime when it's cold out here. Got all my staves, uh, or a lot of them. I've got a lot more out in the barn, but this is some of the staves that I've got up here in the rafters. Uh, and a bucket of arrows, and my coolers. All right, so this bench is just an old shaven horse. You can find 
uh, plans online for these things, and they're really not that hard to make, and they're actually pretty doggone useful. This one's got a pin right here. You can adjust this up and down, so if you're working on a real thick, heavy stave, you can uh, get more space in there, and then once you get those limbs shaved down, you can drop it down. Just put your, uh, put your foot on here, and it clamps it down so that you can work your staves, but uh, this thing has been used a lot. All right, so this little jig, I, I did a video a while back on how I made this. This is basically just, you know, I, I made mine out of poly or plastic, but you can make them out of one by fours. Uh, but it's got this little bar in here and I've got two different settings um, that hold the arrow shafts at different degrees for, uh, against this uh, little sanding belt here. And what it does is just hold that arrow there, let you uh, allow you to rotate it and get the proper angle for mounting uh, tips. And then also you can move it uh, to get your knock taper just right. All right, so moving along, uh, my big vacuum here. I love this thing. This was actually, somebody gave this to me. Uh, they bought it at a yard sale or something and then just didn't have a use for it. So they, uh, they brought it here. I don't know how much this thing would cost if you had to buy it new, but I would imagine it ain't cheap. But I use this thing a lot, especially when I'm grinding fiberglass handles for two-piece takedowns. Uh, I just take the input hose here, or the, yeah, the, the intake here, and hook it up to the back of my belt sander, which is right here. And this thing is a powerful vacuum. And so it sucks all of that fiberglass dust up into these bags, and you don't have to worry about breathing all that stuff. Now, when I'm grinding those glass uh, handles, I do wear a respirator just because there is a little bit of that stuff floating around in the air and you definitely don't want that stuff in your lungs. That's nasty. Uh, I've got my stuff for uh, my fiberglass handles here, some resin, got all my, uh, my fiberglass cloth and all that stuff over there. I gotta clean this place up. And then I've got my arrow shafts. I've got a bunch of arrow shafts here in different rough, very rough uh, spine groups. Now the story behind this, I built this box because I was going to start selling shafts. I was going to start selling these Tonkin cane shafts and I bought a thousand of them uh, and, and straight from China, straight from the manufacturer. Uh, but when I got them, I just didn't feel, I didn't feel like sorting through all of these things because I bought, you know, a bunch of 45, 50s, uh, 50, 55s, you know, and so on. But the spine groups were terrible. I mean, in the 50 pound, 50, 55 pound, for example, you might have 70 pound shafts in there. They did a terrible job of spining these things. And then also the, the, the weight range on these things was, you know, within uh, 100 shafts, you might have a weight range or a span of 150 or 200 grains. And so to feel good about selling these things, I was gonna have to go through there and weigh and spine every single one and I just didn't want to worry about it. Uh, so what I do now is just keep them here at the shop, and if I have a student come for a bow building class that wants to build some arrows, uh, we can come over here and just uh, pick out a group of staves that's gonna match together, and, uh, and they can make some shafts. And of course, I've got, if there's an open space in this shop, it's, something's gonna get stuck there, and you can see that here. All right, and the last couple of things I'll just point out, uh, my little Delta belt, belt sander, I got this at the same time I got my little Ryobi uh, saw over there. I have used this thing, I mean, I would like to know how many hours I've put on this little belt sander. Probably 20 years I've had it and it's still going strong. I have had to make a couple little modifications to it, uh, keep it oiled up, but <clears throat> I use this thing a lot for rounding out tips, uh, narrowing out tips, uh, grinding fiberglass handles uh, for the two-piece takedowns. Um, sometimes I'll use it for the, the sh shaping up the fades and stuff on a bow, like this one. Use it for doing this kind of stuff. I know some of the self-bow purists kind of frown upon that, using power tools on a self-bow, but when you turn out as many bows as I do and you have students, that aren't, don't have the grip strength that it takes to run a rasp all day, this thing really comes out in handy. Um, and this little bow is one that I just finished. 
I did a drawing uh, for the folks over at Patreon just to show my appreciation for people signing up to help support the videos I put out. And this one is going to Travis here real quick. That's gonna be a nice bow for him. And then I've got my all my Bits and Burger fletchings, fletching jigs here that I use for fletching all my arrows. I got these things. These are very, very good uh, fletching jigs and the cost reflects that. They're about 90 bucks a piece. Uh, I've got a dozen of them, but I didn't have to pay for them. I had a, a buddy that got all these probably 10 years ago from a guy that had an archery shop that was going out of business. He got all those fletching jigs. He got uh, buckets of feathers, old bear razor heads. I mean, all kinds of traditional archery paraphernalia for 150 bucks. And so uh, he got to where he just wasn't gonna mess with it anymore and uh, gave it all to me. So I was in a good spot there. But I'm sure there's some stuff, I got all my bows hanging up here. Um, I'm sure there's some stuff that I'm missing, but I hope you guys enjoyed the, uh, the little tour around the shop. Maybe you got some ideas for the, that you can incorporate into your own shop. But uh, with that, if you, uh, if you want more like in-depth, like super in-depth and exclusive uh, bow building stuff, you should seriously check out my Patreon site. I've got uh, probably five, six hours of additional content over there that you're just not gonna see on Facebook. I mean, not Facebook, um, YouTube. And then I'm also working on some DVDs right now. So uh, be watching the website um, for when those things come out. So with that, We'll see you.